everybody. So we are beginning chapter 21, which is all about the blood vessels and circulation. So blood vessels are the tubes through which the heart pumps the blood to get it all around the body and out to the smallest vessels, which are the capillary beds. They are classified by size and their histological organization. And of course, they're really important in controlling overall cardiovascular regulation. And we'll learn how, mostly through vasoconstriction, vasodilation, and control of precapillary sphincters. The largest blood vessels attach directly to the heart. The pulmonary trunk leaves the right ventricle of the heart and then is the blood on its way to the lungs for pulmonary circuit. And they, the aorta, leaves the left ventricle and it carries the oxygen, oxygenated blood away from the heart out to the rest of the body in the systemic circuit. So those are the two largest blood vessels that are arteries, okay? And arteries, again, carry blood away from the heart. It has nothing to do with whether it has oxygen or not, it's the direction of flow. So if you're moving away from the heart, it's an artery. If you're going towards the heart, it is a vein. Okay, now the largest vessels leaving the heart are called arteries. They give way to a smaller version that is still moving away from the heart that is called an arteriole. And arterioles lead to capillaries. Now capillaries are the turnaround points. Okay, so you can only go away from the heart as far as the capillary bed. Once the blood goes through that capillary bed, it is now on its way back to the heart because it is in the capillary beds where it's going to let go of the oxygen it's carrying and pick up carbon dioxide. It's also going to let go of nutrients and pick up wastes. After the capillary bed, it will enter the smallest veins, which are called venules, and venules will give rise to larger veins and they are going to return the blood to the heart. And the two largest veins of all are the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. Now this is a really good time to, t to remind you of something. For this chapter test, I will only ask you about the vessels that are listed in your orange lab book. This chapter goes through all of the vessels. I will only hold you responsible for the same ones that you had to know for lab. So if you know that list of vessels for lab, that's the same list you can use for lecture. So I won't put any questions that are on vessels that are not in your lab book. Okay, so looking at these vessels, if we looked at what they're made out of, they have three layers. Each one's called a tunica. Remember how the eye had tunics? This is kind of a similar word. Tunica is Latin for tunic. Okay, and the three tunics are labeled the tunica intima, and you can think intimate, that's the most interior part, it's the lining of the blood vessel. Then there is a tunica media, it's in the middle. And then there's the tunica externa, which is the outside layer. The tunica intima has an endothelial lining. Remember, endothelium is, is simple squamous epithelium often. There is also a connective tissue layer. And there can be an internal elastic membrane, only in arteries. So these are elastic fibers that are in this innermost layer that are right between the border between the tunica intima and the tunica media. That's the internal elastic membrane. Then we get to the middle layer, the tunica media. It has different smooth muscle sheets, at least two sheets of smooth muscle. It goes around the endothelium that lines the lumen and it binds to the inner and outer layers. And then after these muscle layers, we have the external elastic membrane. And that is the separator between the tunica media from the tunica externa. The tunica externa is going to let that vessel be holding on to adjacent tissues. And it is made of primarily connective fibers like collagen and elastin fibers. And in veins, there are also smooth muscle cells in this layer. It also contains a very interesting thing, the vasovasorum, or the vessel of vessels. Your larger blood vessels have so many layers of cells that are living that need oxygen, they actually need blood vessels to feed the vessel cells. And so these are small arteries and veins in the walls of large arteries and veins. Isn't that crazy? And they're going to deliver oxygen to the walls of the tunica media and the tunica externa. The tunica intima has direct contact with the blood, so usually it will get its oxygen from the blood directly. 
Okay, so this is a diagram and a photo micrograph. You will need to be familiar with this photo micrograph for the lab exam. And it's just showing a cross section between an artery and a vein. And right away, you should be able to see some really big differences. The vein has a thicker wall, but it is a lot smaller a diameter for the artery. The vein has a much bigger diameter, but it has a much thinner wall, so it has a much bigger lumen. Lumen is the space inside the tube, okay? So let's just focus over here on the artery side. So in here where my mouse is moving right now, that's where the blood would be. And so we have our little bit of endothelium and connective tissue, so that makes our tunica intima. And then right here, you see this little wiggly, they made it kind of a reddish line, is my internal elastic membrane, so that's the border. And then we get into the tunica media, which is all of the smooth muscle sheets here, okay? And then right here would be the, the external elastic membrane, and then we get into the tunica externa. So this is a much thicker tunica media than we will see over here in the vein. Okay, if we look at the wall of the vein up close, we still have a tunica intima. We do not have the internal elastic part. We have a much thinner tunica media. We don't even have the external elastic part. We do have a tunica externa, it's much thinner, but we see some smooth muscle cells scattered even amongst the connective tissues of the tunica externa. All right, so those are the major, major differences. And here's a nice list of them. Arteries have thicker walls and because they have to be subjected to higher blood pressures. A constricted artery has a small round lumen, and a vein has a large irregular shaped lumen. Veins are large and floppy, pretty much. The endothelium of a constricted artery gets folded up. Arteries are more elastic than veins. They can spring back into shape easier. And veins have a feature that is absent in arteries, and that's valves. And the vein, the vein valves do exactly what the valves do in the heart. It prevents blood from going backwards and helps us move the blood, especially in your legs against gravity, keeps moving it up towards the heart rather than letting it fall back down. So arteries are very elastic. They have all those elastic internal and external membranes because they are the closest to the beating heart. Every time the heart squeezes, the pressure in the vessels around the heart, of course, goes up. And so these are pressure waves that need to be able to be smoothed out. So the arteries have lots more elastic tissue in them. Contractility, we are, have the ability to stimulate those smooth muscle cells in the walls of arteries to change diameter. And vasoconstriction and vasodilation are completely controlled by only the sympathetic division of the autonomic system. So we keep them slightly tense, slightly constricted, so that if we need to, we can dilate them, or if we need to make it even tighter, we can constrict them. Constricting it makes the lumen smaller and raises the blood pressure. Dilating a vessel enlarges the lumen and makes the blood pressure drop. So what, what, do you do, what happens when you vasoconstrict and vasodilate? Well, they affect the afterload on the heart. Remember, afterload is the amount of pressure in the vessels outside the heart, like the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, that the heart has to overcome to open the semilunar valve. So if there's a lot of blood pressure in those vessels, it's much harder for the heart to actually push blood out. It also affects peripheral blood pressure and it will affect the blood flow through the capillary beds. Okay, so going from the heart out to the capillaries, the arteries will change. They start out as elastic arteries, then they become muscular arteries, and then finally they are arterioles before becoming the capillaries. So let's start at the top. Elastic arteries are also called conducting arteries. And these are your largest ones, like the pulmonary trunk and aorta. And the tunica media is very thick. It has lots of elastic fibers, but fewer muscle cells. And the elasticity helps even out those pressure waves from the pulse force. Muscular arteries are also called distribution arteries. And this is where most of the arteries of our bodies fit in categories. Okay? Most of them are medium-sized muscular arteries. And the tunica media has lots of muscle cells. And we have a little bit less of the elastic tissue. Arterioles are called the resistance vessels. They have little or no tunica externa. And they have a thin or incomplete tunica media. So they're primarily 
a tunica intima and a thin tunica media. So you're not going to be doing a whole lot of uh, expanding and contracting of arterioles, but they will lead into the capillary beds and we will have little muscular controls between the arterioles and the capillaries called pre-capillary sphincters. So you may have heard of the term an aneurysm. What is an aneurysm? Well, an aneurysm is a weak spot in an arterial wall that begins to bulge outward. And it can be weak because of the elastic fibers not being properly arranged or not withstanding forces. And it can rupture. So the, the fear of an aneurysm, especially aneurysm in the brain, is of course if the vessel ruptures and we have bleeding on the brain, it compresses brain tissue. So I don't know if you guys were Mythbusters fans, but we lost one of our Mythbusters last week, Grant Imahara. He actually died from a brain aneurysm at 49 years old. Sorry if you're, if you're watching this sometime after summer of 2020. He died some time ago for you guys. Okay, so here's a nice graphic that will explain the differences between, here's all the stuff we just did about arteries, here's the capillaries at the bottom, and here are the veins. And we're going to go through these one at a time. So on the vein side, this one's showing it round, although we know it can be very irregularly shaped. We have large veins, which have a very thick tunica externa, a thin tunica media, and it has a tunica intima that's pretty consistent. Medium-sized vein, the diameter is smaller, we have a little bit more smooth muscle here, and venule is basically the intima and the externa without any um, media at all. Here's the arteries. The elastic artery has a lot of elastic tissue here and here. We get to a muscular artery where we don't have as much elastic tissue. Instead, we have more of the muscle cells. And we get to an arterial. We basically just have a tunica media and an intima without an externa. And now we can look at the capillaries. So here are two of the three kinds of capillaries, continuous capillaries and fenestrated capillaries. Capillaries are classified by how much leakage there is between cells due to whether or not the cells are continuously connected to each other. So a continuous capillary has a full endothelium that doesn't allow things to, to very easily pass between the cells. So it's a very good blocker. A fenestrated capillary has big pores in the capillary cells themselves so that more fluid is able to leak out. Okay. So the capillaries are the smallest vessels with the thinnest walls. They are microscopic and they permeate all active tissues that use oxygen and nutrients. This is where we're going to have diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients, and waste. And we, it creates a three-chambered area for diffusion. We have inside the capillary, we have the interstitial fluid, and then we have inside the cells. So we're going we're gonna to know that a lot of exchange has to happen between interstitial fluid and inside the cells. So from now on, we're just going to concentrate on what's going between the blood and the interstitial fluid. Those are the two compartments we're going to compare for the rest of this chapter. Okay, so the capillary structure is pretty much just a tube of endothelium inside a very thin basement membrane. That's it. No muscles, no tunica media, no tunica external connective tissue. And it's usually only about as wide as a single red blood cell. Very tiny. So again, the three kinds of capillaries. The first one is continuous. And this is in all of your tissues except epithelia and cartilage. And they have a complete continuous endothelial lining. That's where they get their name. They let water, small solutes, and lipid-soluble materials through. But they do not let blood cells or plasma proteins through. They have specialized continuous capillaries in the central nervous system and thymus, which have an even more restricted permeability, for example, in areas like the blood-brain barrier, where we take these continuous capillaries and cover them up with astrocytes so that we have more layers of cell membranes that things would have to pass through to get from one side to the other. Fenestrated capillaries have pores, and they are made to be leakier and to let larger things through. So you're going to have them in places where you're going to have major exchanges of actual proteins or hormones. So places like the choroid plexus, endocrine organs, your kidneys, and in your intestinal tract. Now why would you want them to be fenestrated in your intestines? 
because you're going to be taking the food that you have broken down into fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and you're going to bring those macromolecules through the digestive lining and put them into the capillaries to put them in the bloodstream. So we need to have a little bit more um, flexibility with getting bigger things in. The last kind of capillaries are the leakiest of all. They're hardly even really a continuous tube. They are sinusoidal capillaries. They have large gaps between the endothelial cells, and these let water and big plasma proteins and other large proteins through. These are found in the liver, in the spleen, in the bone marrow, and in some of your endocrine organs and glands. And because they let bigger things through, we need to guard these more carefully for looking for pathogens. So we have phagocytic cells that are monitoring the blood at the sinusoids. So here are some images. This is a continuous capillary. You see this nice pink lining, okay? The basement membrane is around it. There are spaces between the cells, but they're pretty tight. When we get over here to the fenestrated capillaries, you can see the little tiny holes or pores that would let more things through. And then over here, this is a sinusoid. Look how large these spaces are. These are gonna let very big things out of the blood into the tissue. And again, we can look at these up closer. Say so between cells, they're kind of interlocking, so they're really not gonna let things go through this space. And there's our ones with the pores, so leakier, leakiest. So you're only gonna to wanna to put sinusoidal capillaries in areas where you have a very tight control of a capillary network. Things like the liver, where we're gonna be taking out nutrients, or like in the anterior pituitary, where we have the um, hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. So we're letting specific proteins, namely hormones from the hypothalamus, come into the anterior pituitary tissue. Okay, the capillary beds, or also called capillary plexuses, or where we're gonna connect the smallest arteries to the smallest veins. So one arteriole is gonna have a capillary bed that will connect it to one venule. And we're going to have muscular rings around the opening between the arteriole and the capillary bed called a precapillary sphincter. A sphincter is kind of a controllable valve made of smooth muscle. And so we are able to open and close the precapillary sphincter to either let blood through that capillary or not. Okay. We also are going to have thoroughfare channels that are direct connections between the arteriole and venue without precapillary sphincters. So let me show you this diagram. So here are arteries, okay, and this is the arteriole, and then we enter the capillary beds, and all these little dots here on the sides are our precapillary sphincters. That's what they look like up close. Now we have all these alternate routes of getting blood across, and we have one thicker thoroughfare channel that runs through the middle right here. And notice these precapillary sphincters are not going to be enough to close that off. They can only close off the smaller vessels. All right. We also have an unusual thing in this diagram. We have a skip over the capillary section. This is a vessel that goes directly between the arteriole over to the venule and has no capillary in there. This is called an arteriovenous anastomosis. So this is not going to be a vessel that's going to allow for a lot of diffusion of things through. Instead, we're going to do our diffusion of oxygen up here in the capillary bed. This will just let us quickly get blood over here so that not all of the blood that goes from artery to this vein is deoxygenated. So we can actually oxygenate the cells of the vein. And here is a photomicrograph. So here we have a small artery, we have a smaller arteriole, and we have all of these tiny little capillaries. And you can see these little dots here are individual red blood cells in there. All right, so I'm going to stop this first presentation at slide 33, and we will pick up the next one at 34.